Did you ever see, and possibly you did, a child playing with some other child, and all of a sudden you heard some sort of little disturbance. And one was crying out at the other at the top of his lungs, and the second one had hands over the ears screaming back at them, I can't hear you. Possibly you have done things like that. <clears throat> Maybe even as an adult, you've done things like that. Usually that meant I don't want to hear what you're saying. I don't want to discuss it or whatever else. Now children, I'm not quite sure what they mean other than what they actually say. I can't hear you and they're trying to yell loud enough where they actually can't with their hands over their ears. But sometimes, in another way, adults do this. You'll remember after having heard the truth that cut them to the heart that Stephen's hearers cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him. Acts 7.57. A good question at this point is, people do that, but does God ever put his finger in his ears, as it were, and say to people on earth, I can't hear you? Well, of course, he's not childish. But if I know my Bible, he's not going to listen to some people. And this sermon today is dealing with certain people that God will not hear. And you might picture him in your mind as these people speak to him with his hands over his ears saying, I can't hear you. As you study the scriptures, and you might find others, but there, there are at least 11 men who, people whom God won't hear. That is, will not hear their prayers. They're speaking to God, but God will not hear them. God won't, the first one, God won't listen to a man who himself is hard of hearing. In Proverbs chapter four, or 1, verse 24, beginning, Because I called, and you refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Also, you might tack on verse 28 to Proverbs 1.24. Now, let's look at this for a moment. Let's see some strong language that's stronger in the original even than in the English. The word called, God called, kara. It's a very strong word. It, meaning, it means actually to accost a person. You're really getting their attention. It's sort of like somebody getting another one by the lapel and looking him in the eye and saying, I'm talking to you. It's that kind of uh, idea of called. Now, when the tables are turned and they called using the same word in Hebrew for called, we just read that God will not answer, and that's a Hebrew word, anah. God will not answer, anah. That is to eye or pay attention to. He's going to ignore you. And though they got up at a at, at, Dawn, and the literal meaning of getting up at dawn is early. They got up early. They can't catch God, though they start early trying to catch him. Matzah, that's the word, find. They can't find him. He's not at home for them. I remember one time years ago, I called on a 
wealthy man's house and the maid came to the door and I asked for him and the word that came back to me was he is not receiving today. Well, he's there, but he didn't want to talk. Zechariah said, Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law. Therefore it has come to pass, that is, he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. So a person who is deaf to God's call, that is his word, is going to find God deaf to his own prayers or call. So there's one caliber of person who God will not hear his prayers. But there's also then the hard-hearted man. Proverbs 21, verse 13. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself and shall not be heard. Proverbs 21, 13. This word stoppeth, atom, is expressive. It can refer to a window that is jammed shut and can't be opened. And if we jam our ears shut, that's the idea. God, in effect, closes the windows of heaven to us. I find it very interesting and notice the vividness of these terms and how they make things so very clear to us and really how strong they are in what God's getting across. I also see that a man with bloody hands is one who God will not hear. The prophet Isaiah wrote, Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away your evil doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, chapter 1, 15 and 16. Although it's unlikely that we have literal blood on our hands, yet if one hates his brother in his heart, the Bible says that God counts that as murder. The inspired apostle John wrote, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 3 and verse 15. I've often said, and you know it to be the case, that the battle to serve God begins in the mind. And thus, when we control our mind with the truths of Jesus, then we're going to head off those sins, whether it's sins of omission or commission. What about the so-called backstabbers? who bite and devour one another, Galatians 5.15. What about their prayers? Well, they won't have their prayers answered. One who is responsible because of a bad example, a bad conduct of life for the spiritual death of a brother, a stumbling block, will also be in that category. Again, emphasizing the importance of godly living before others that are influenced by the things we do and don't do, where we go, causes people to see Christ living in us. Well, of course, an idol worshiper is one who cannot expect God to hear his prayers. In Jeremiah 11, 11 through 13, the prophet said, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods. Well, Americans are too civilized and enlightened. Might have to put that in quote sometimes. <laughs> to bow to the image of some sort of gold bug or some kind of bull or goat 
or some contrivance of that nature. But that does not mean that we have outgrown idol worship. An idol is anything that we put before God. And thus we really have many idols in America today. We now worship the gods of false science, the gods of sex, silver and gold, power, prestige, fame, pleasure, and possessions. I won't try to read all the scriptures to this group of Christians that point out that those things lead us into sin. Some of them may be used rightly, but we cannot put any of them before serving God. 1 Timothy 6.20, 1 Peter 2.11, 2 Peter 2.14, and Colossians 3.5. It may be that your husband is your idol, your wife is your idol, your parents are your idols, your job is your idol, your children are your idols. What do I mean, what I said earlier? Any of those things put before God that causes you to compromise the truth becomes your idol. Also, the Bible speaks of a wandering man, a wandering man. They're unstable is the idea. They have, thus they, they have to Always be tossed to and fro. They've not refrained their feet. They don't exercise self-control. And God doesn't accept them. They may go through some sort of fasting. People of Jesus' day did. They may implore God with prayers, but it won't work. If you read Jeremiah 14, verses 10 through 12, and remember Jeremiah is in the city not long before it would be destroyed, and why would God destroy them through Babylon? It was because of their ungodliness. The psalmist prayed, Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Psalm 119, verse 110. And you read in the New Testament where the inspired apostle Paul condemned busybodies who learned to be idle. Now watch what it says wandering from house to house, speaking things which they ought not. 1 Timothy 5.13. Jude spoke of some, and he called them wandering stars. And reserved for them was the blackness of darkness forever. Verse 13. There's no stability to them. And I think we've all known characters of that nature. They're just, we would say, you can't depend upon them. God won't hear their prayers. He will not hear a man who hates good and loves evil. Micah 3, 1 through 4, the prophet said, I pray you, who hate the good and love the evil, then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. We could spend a long time on this one just reading the scriptures that give forth that same sentiment. But then there's the person who will not forgive those who've trespassed against them. In Mark 11, 24 and 25, Jesus said, And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. For if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. This is not talking about the responsibility of the sinner to repent. You have to take all of what the Bible says about what one must do to be forgiven of sins, and that involves repentance. But once a person is done, all the Lord requires of them, as far as we know, to be forgiven. And we're very much aware of that sin. Possibly their sin involved us as far as sinning against us. We're expected then to forgive them. That is to not hold it against them any longer. 
Now, this ties in somewhat with the wandering man, the unstable man, but using a common term, a wishy-washy man. Now, you may have to find that. If you were translating that into some other language, I don't know how it would come across. But listen to this and see this. this won't help. As James writes to Christians in James 1, verses 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Now watch. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's what I mean by wishy-washy. You don't ever know what to expect out of the person. You cannot put your trust in that person's promises. In Matthew 21, 22, And all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, Jesus said, believing ye shall receive. Now that was said, of course, to the apostles. But we're taught God answers our prayers. When we're righteous and we pray effectual, fervent prayers, the Bible makes it clear they avail much with God. But the life we're living must not be a wishy-washy life. If a Christian doesn't believe God can and will answer prayer, then he might as well not pray. This should cause every one of us to take inventory of ourselves concerning how often we pray. Have we learned how to pray? Do we know how to pray certain prayers? Do those of us in the worship assembly leading prayer know what we should pray at given times? All of this is a learned thing. As we've said most often, Christianity is a learned thing. And thus we learn how to pray from the scriptures. God's not going to hear a selfish man. In our society, we find people everywhere, and it's encouraged by the way people live to be selfish, to be self-willed, to have our way no matter what it does to anybody else. And I've already read to you from James. Remember, he wrote to Christians. I'll read to you again from James, James 4, 2, and 3. He said, Ye desire to have and cannot obtain Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss. Well, what was the matter of where they ask amiss? That ye may consume it upon your lust. A lot of people pray for all sorts of things, that they could have a better life from the standpoint of material gain here. They're not thinking about the fact that they're to live here faithful to God. Whatever little or great they have is to be used in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things should be added unto you. And there those Christians were while the New Testament was even being revealed and written who were praying and not having their prayer answered because they were fighting one another. You realize in James 4, 2, and 3, you have the root of why there are wars in all the world, where those wars have come from. It's because people are covetous. People live for themselves. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. Now, I know this is addressed to Christians concerning them being caught up in this error. But Christians are humans like everybody else. And thus you see what guides the world. And while there always will be people, if you please, bullying other people and nations bullying other nations. Today there's one reason that Russia is fighting Ukraine. They covet the Ukraine, period. There was one reason that Hitler did all that he did in starting World War II. He wanted to control the whole world. There's one reason Japan did what it did for the same thing. And so you look at anybody, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and so on. 
God's not going to hear a fellow like that. But another one, a man who does not honor his wife. Now this may get closer to home. Peter wrote to Christians and addressed specifically this matter. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of your position as the husband. Knowledge of her position as your wife. Knowledge of what God's will is for both of you fulfilling those roles. But he says then to the husband, giving honor unto the wife. This will be good on this day that we call Father's Day. In fact, I bring this out now toward the end of the lesson because this lesson and even this morning in the class and the lesson this afternoon really have a heavy bearing upon the man of the house, the father, because he's the guy in the house. And if these things are to be put into practice and kept going as they ought to, the father's expected by God to do it. When Adam and Eve had sinned, it was Eve that the devil used to get to Adam. And when God came to discuss the matter, you don't find him dealing with Eve. He dealt with the head of the race and the head of their family who had abdicated his responsibility. And thus husbands dwell with them according to the knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, I'm sorry that over many, many years now that the feminists have tried to make themselves out to be the vessel that is not weaker. But this is not talking about intellect. It's talking about the place in life God made the woman to operate. Everything I've just said would get me stoned to death by some people or worse but I can't change the word of God. The woman was created for a given position and a given work. And when she steps out of that, then she's abdicating her responsibility. Now I think in this day and age, for whatever I think so is worth, it's good for a woman to have something she can fall back on. Because she may marry somebody and think he's the grandest thing in the world and he turned out to be the lowest lout that ever was. And she's still going to eat and feed those kids because he's off running around doing something else. He's certainly not heading up the house. He's certainly not rearing his children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And you see the emphasis put on Timothy's mother and grandmother as to the influence they had, but nothing's mentioned of the father when it came to rearing him according to the truth of the Bible. That from a babe thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which will make the, make the wise of the salvation. Who taught him? Grandma and mama. That's who taught him. That wasn't the way God wants it. He wants daddy to be running the home and rearing the children and nurturing the admonition of the Lord. But part of daddy doing that is helping the wife fulfill her position. Notice honoring the wife as into the weaker vessel. Now watch and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Obviously, he thinks of the person who is the husband being a Christian and the wife a Christian. But then here's our point of the lesson today. You do these things, Christian husbands, now watch, that your prayers be not hindered. You don't practice these things, 1 Peter 3, 7. Just picture God as you speak to him as a husband, saying, I can't hear you because you don't treat that woman like God expected her to be treated as your wife and the mother of your children. Now, can you imagine children listening to parents fuming, fussing, griping, and fighting, and then a moment later saying, now let's all get around the table before we eat, let's have prayer. Doesn't quite fit, does it? So it is with every one of us that we must be mindful of our place in life. The man must be, so must the woman. 
You can ignore these things, but what I've read to you will read and mean the same thing on the day of judgment as it reads and means now. And then, as if to sum it all up, as we close the last one, and it will, it'll take into consideration everything we've said and anything else I've left out. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, 1 John 3, 22. So God's not going to hear. He's going to look at you and say, I can't hear you to the disobedient person. In Psalm 66, 18, the psalmist said, I, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What does that mean? It means I know I'm in sin, but I'm not repenting of it. I'm not turning of it. I'm continuing that same course of transgression. This little story might help us as we close the lesson. Several children were watching one of these fellows that sells balloons. And he was filling the balloons with helium gas. And to make them attractive, I guess you could call it as an advertising process. Every now and then he had let one of the balloons go. And it would rise up quickly and be blown by the air. The audience would do an awe, especially the children. He kept doing that. One child said, well, will the red balloon go as high as the other? Well, that sounds like something a child might ask. Might be some other color, but will the red balloon go as high as the other's? Well, the wise man said as he dealt with the balloons, yes, it's not the color on the outside, but it's what they're on the inside that counts. So if, if our prayers may be all flowery and colored and whatever else with all kinds of adjectives and if that's all they are they don't have the right, th right stuff on the inside to make them rise as used to be said that prayer didn't go any higher than the ceiling but when one is walking the straight and narrow way of truth who loves God with his whole heart loves the brethren loves his neighbors himself, who's righteous before God, who is sincere in all that he does in the study of the Bible and the living it, the opposing error, then those prayers will rise to the throne of God in heaven and they will be answered. Now, think about it for a moment. Is God having to say, I can't hear you far more to the human race than he does. I can hear you, and I will answer. Well, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. And these words we've pulled from various places in the Scriptures concerning how God will not hear. These words our words are designed to show us how to shape our character so God will hear. And so the whole Bible is designed to bring us back to God. And we're taught in Romans 12, 1 and 2, to be reconciled to God. We left God. He doesn't have to be reconciled to us. We need to be reconciled to Him. We left Him when we sinned. And the gospel calls us back to Him. And we must hear that gospel. We must understand it. <clears throat> we must from the heart obey it. In believing that Christ is the Son of God, <clears throat> repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Christ, and being baptized for the remission of sins. 
the Lord adds us to the spiritual body of Christ, the church. And therein, we continue to listen to God. And we're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And the promise is, and we know it always, God does hear us. And God does answer us. So let us remove anything from our lives that would cause God to say, I can't hear you. If we need to repent of our sins, confess them and pray for forgiveness, then let us do it. We're to encourage each other to walk the straight and narrow way of truth. We have a limited time here. And I don't want my time spent here by God saying, I can't hear you. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.